the night sky has been an important influence on human culture for as long as that culture has existed, inspiring important works of art, literature, music, and poetry. Our connection with the night sky informs much of our folklore, and it underscores the need to preserve that cultural memory through the conservation of dark night skies. But to care enough about something to preserve it, we need to understand it, and for that we turn to educators. And for that reason, it is my pleasure to introduce to you one of those educators, Vivian White. So welcome, Vivian, and thank you for taking the time to speak to us today. Did I get all that right about your background? Uh, you know what? I didn't hear any of it, so I hope so. <laughs> I hope everybody else got to hear it. <laughs> yes. But thank well, you so much. Can you tell us a little bit more about ASP and the Free Learning Center? Yeah, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific has been around for 131 years. We're an international organization, and we um, support people in astronomy education from cradle to grave, the whole way through, um, from the very young all the way through to professional astronomers and, um, and mostly the general public. So uh, I'm pleased to be joining you from uh, sheltering in place this time. Yeah, we're in San Francisco, California. And my job is I uh, mostly work with the NASA Night Sky Network, uh, a group of amateur astronomers uh, around the United States. But I'm so excited to see people from all over the world. And well, we are too, and we're very excited about your presentation today, which is about the lore of the night sky from around the world in different cultures. And that's a topic that I am sure is of interest to a lot of our viewers. Um, so with that, maybe you can go ahead and take it away. Absolutely, thank you so much for having me on here. Um, and happy International Dark Sky Week, happy first night of Ramadan. Uh, may it be generous and uh, may you all have um, a lot of safety sheltering in place this week. Um, I am thrilled to join you. I just, with the help of a lot of friends and colleagues have created a new activity. It's in the draft form and I'm gonna share it with you today. It's called Legends in the Sky, and it's all about constellations from around the world and how to talk about them as we observe the night sky. Let's see if it'll get started. Oh yeah, this is part of a project that I'm working on right now called Big Astronomy, which is a planetarium show that will be debuting in September for Fall Astronomy Day with any luck and you can learn more about it. It's about all of the people and places and discoveries that it takes to, um, all of the people mostly that it takes to do astronomy in the modern world, especially down in Chile. So I'll start this activity uh, asking you all if you know any constellations in the night sky. Have anyone ever shown you a constellation in the night sky? You can type it into the chat if you'd like. Uh, if you're watching online, you can um, tap it into the comments. Who taught you to find that constellation? This is kind of part of our shared story is that these stories are passed down often from generation to generation. So if you're not familiar with the night stick guy, this picture can seem really disorganized, right? It just looks like a, an array of stars. Um, humans, that's us create these patterns and mental maps to make sense of our world. And we do the same thing with the night sky. So do you have a map in your mind that you use every day, some sort of pattern, maybe the path to school or at this point, maybe just how to get to the bathroom in the middle of the night. <laughs> uh, these are mental maps that we make and we do the same with the night sky. Constellations, Oh, I'm just reading all these great comments. Thank you, uh, Val. Cygnus, your mom taught you to find Cygnus in the night sky. That's great. Um, constellations are these patterns that, of stars in the sky that people from cultures all around the world use to talk about the night sky. Um, the common constellations that we know uh, are from the Greeks, but cultures all over the world and throughout history have seen patterns in the sky. Now, if you look at this, you don't see actual images in the sky, right? You just see a bunch of stars. We make these constellations and we have to imagine a lot of the parts of it. So what parts of a constellation do you see and which parts do you have to imagine? The part actually I'll just say that we see are the stars, but what are the parts that we have to imagine? We use our imagination to create these. <laughs> Can 
for just a minute. Yeah, the Big Dipper and Orion are things we're looking for in the night sky right now. Um, we're going to use Orion actually tonight. I'm going to see if we can go on to this next one. So here's a constellation. The Greeks call this Orion. Um, and I um, hope that you can see this right now. The activity that we have online is just a piece of paper that we folded in half. I'll show you where to get that at the end. So on your screen, you see the constellation of Orion, but lots of other cultures from around the world have used these same stars to create their own constellations. For example, in Brazil, the native Tucano people see the handle of a wooden carving tool. You can see that might be important to their culture for a different reason um, than Orion is for us. Um, the ancient Egyptians saw the father of the gods, Sa. Uh, ancient Macedonians saw, they were a farming culture and they saw a plow. So. These stars have represented lots of different things to lots of different people. And tonight, luckily, if you go out, you will still see this constellation in the sky. It's getting lower in the sky and it's a little bit harder for the Southern Hemisphere right now. But in the Northern Hemisphere, it's still fairly high in the sky. We're looking for this star right here. Um, it's actually a little bit red when you see it in the night sky. And we call this Betelgeuse, or Betelgeuse, depending on who you ask. Um, and that's the shoulder of Orion uh, for our uh, Greek constellations. So this activity that we use now, we are going to uh, encourage you to create your own constellation. That right there being Betelgeuse, the red star, you can download this um, activity, there's a PowerPoint, uh, sorry, a PDF of this uh, online, and you can encourage your children or um, family at home to create your own constellation in the night sky. Now, this might talk, you might uh, have a constellation that represents something important to you, or um, maybe a type of game that's being played this time of year. What's your favorite sport that's happening right now, usually? <laughs> um, some of your values, or oftentimes uh, people use uh, people in their lives who are important to them. Uh, even animals, there are a lot of animals in the constellations. All right. So you can write your own constellation story here and create any picture you want. A lot of times for younger children, they can find letters in the night sky and look for those. Um, think of something you'd like to commemorate. It doesn't always have to be look exactly like what we think. So if you want to commemorate an author, for example, you might see a book. Um, I asked my son to create one. This is um, from a circumpolar constellation in the night sky. Oops. Uh, this is a smiley face. I believe it's from his favorite um, singer, Perry Grip. And he says, Perry Grip flew to the sky and threw big rocks to make up a smiley face. So um, you can uh, create any constellation you like. There are five different constellations in this activity. And uh, each one comes with some legends here. Um, and uh, the worksheet to make your very own. So why don't you just give you a little bit of background as well. Um, oh, this is where you can find it. This is a draft version because we are in the middle of a pandemic and um, there will probably be some changes made before we um, show up again. Um, and this is, you'll see, has a mostly um, mostly has all the things we need on it, but there will be a few more things added. And this link will always work to the latest version. So I just wanted to give some notes to you all if you're going to present this. Um, we use uh, very simple stories uh, when we are telling the stories of other people because we don't want to appropriate anyone's culture. So when we're talking about the legends of other cultures, we use the word legends, not stories. Although sometimes I goof up and use the word stories as well. Um, we use legends because often the, the constellations that are seen in the night sky are representative maybe of ancestors or 
They could be stories that are only told by certain people in a culture or certain times of the year. Um, and we don't want to tell stories that are not ours. So giving just um, some simple examples of what the object is that is seen in the sky can be a respectful way to talk about that. I want to just talk for a minute too about the Greek constellations and kind of give you an idea of how we use those in the night sky. Um, we These constellations, the International Astronomical Union is the current administration that makes up and names all of the things in the night sky, uh, all of the things not here on earth that are out in space. And the International Astronomical Union divides the night sky up into 88 constellations. The whole sky is divided up into constellations. So those are regions surrounding some of these traditional Greek constellations that we see. And professional astronomers and amateur astronomers use those kind of like a map to uh, tell where something is in the sky. So in the same way in the US we have states that the lines divide the states, those lines aren't really there, but they're really useful. Right, they are, um, so I can say Zion National Park is in the state of Utah. Or if I'm looking at the sky, I can say things like the Sombrero Galaxy is in the constellation of Virgo, right? So it's, the boundaries aren't really there. They're invented, but they're also really useful. So that's how we use constellations as professional and amateur astronomers. Uh, one thing I thought was kind of interesting as well, um, when you look, uh, at the night sky in the northern hemisphere, it is flipped upside down from the night sky in the southern hemisphere. So we see things differently. Betelgeuse, which might be the shoulder of Orion in the northern hemisphere, is the foot of a dancing man to the Aboriginal um, storytellers in, um, in Australia in the southern hemisphere. There's also one more thing I wanted to say. This is a beautiful picture of the Paranal um, Observatory in Chile in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, some cultures use the dark spots in the night sky to, the, to make constellations. Um, and uh, there are stories of an emu uh, or a llama. There's a snake in the Milky Way. So it's, it's often done in the Southern Hemisphere because they have a much better view of the Milky Way than we do here in the Northern Hemisphere. And you can also very well see some of those darker spots. Um, so I encourage you to tell these stories, to um, enjoy telling your own story and ask your um, elders in your community what their stories are. These are often a really great opportunity to learn about the stories from our own cultures that we might not have heard of because a lot of the night sky, we don't get to see so much anymore. We might not be out there um, with uh, some of the elders that can tell those stories. So I encourage you to ask your the older people in your life about the stories that they remember learning because they probably had a much better, better view of the night sky than we do today. Um, just to wrap things up, there are links on this uh, activity that go to different online legends and some extensions you can do with the night sky. Um, make a Big Dipper sky clock or in the Southern Hemisphere, make a Southern Cross clock. So there are lots of different notes on there. I hope you enjoy using it and we look forward to hearing from you. That's the end of everything that I have, but I look forward to talking with you more about it. I love to hear about people's constellation stories. Okay, thank you, Vivian, for that wonderful presentation. It's it's clear that uh, that you and your colleagues have a great deal of knowledge in this to share, and I love the sense of involving people in the idea of constellations as being sort of an ongoing aspect of uh, of human culture. Um, let's go to some of the questions that we've been getting on the uh, live feed from social media comments. Um, question for view, for me at least, let's start there, is what, what is your favorite constellation and what about it is special to you? I think um, my favorite constellation is Scorpius. I love the fish hook. I love being able to see it um, in the night sky in the summertime. It, Kind of indicates that we're in the middle of summer here in the northern hemisphere. Um, for us in the northern hemisphere, it's pretty darn low in the night sky. 
Um, but in the Southern Hemisphere, it rises high in the sky. So I especially like to see it from the Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> yeah. Cindy on Facebook asks, um, why do they have a better view of the Milky Way in the Southern Hemisphere than we do here in the North? That's a good question. I wish I had a globe with me. Um, uh, the, the part of the Milky Way that you see in the Southern Hemisphere, let me see, let me make sure I get this right. <laughs> it's higher in the sky because of the direction that the Southern Hemisphere points um, and the Milky Way is lower in the sky for us here in the Northern Hemisphere. We also see it in the summer, which um, they're not, it's <laughs> not as easy to see. There are not as many dark hours here in the summer where they get to see the Milky Way uh, better in the winter, the July, August time. Um, yeah. <laughs> Who taught you the constellations, Vivian? Do you remember? You know what? I didn't actually know very many of them as a child. Yeah, I um I learned them in college when I was I was a physics major, and I thought I wanted to study physics until I took um, an observational astronomy class, and I fell in love with the night sky. Yeah, even here in San Francisco, we had what we called the ultra foggy observatory because <laughs> it's <laughs> almost always foggy. The UFO, for short, it's almost foggy, mm -hmm. always foggy here in San Francisco. Is there a, a particular source for your love of the, the history or the lore behind the constellations as opposed to, I can see the background as being interested in sort of the science and, and you know, physics and astronomy, but um, the, the, the folklore more speaks to us as humans. Is there something about your experience that really caught your attention in that way? Yeah, that, that human piece is really important to me. I love being connected to people um, in different parts of the world and knowing that we're all looking up and seeing this sky and and being able to interpret it in our own ways. Um, I also love that it's been going on since recorded history. I think that there's so much, um, so much good astronomy was done before, uh, wh back when astronomers were astrologers. Um, and when we we just started noticing patterns in the night sky. I mean, this used to be our television, right? Before <laughs> before we had all of this distraction of the modern world, there was a lot of time spent looking up at the night sky. And I, I like to imagine myself connecting to people um, throughout time when okay. I look up. Are there any particular gems among the folklore stories that you know about certain constellations? And could, if you had to pick one, could you share it with us? Well, that's a very good question. <laughs> that's a very open ended question. Um, I love what I've heard of the Hawaiian star lines and the way that they use them to navigate. Um, those stories were so incredibly useful. I, I think I really like the useful ones. I think the navigation using the night sky and how people have used that throughout time, um, as well as uh, a lot of stories have to do with, uh, like for example, the emu story that we were talking about um, when in certain parts of the world when the, the bird or the llama perhaps tips into a lake, that's time to move a herd. So there are, there are some stories that are very important to cultures because of what they tell us about the time of year it is, whether it's time to plant or time to, um, move uh, a herd of animals. I think those are fascinating to me because they're, they're so much a part of the culture that they are actually the timekeepers. I love like those. But I'd love to hear from you all too on social media. What, is, what are your favorite stories? If there are any that you love, I love hearing um, about stories. Um, I heard one about Orion from uh, to that what we could think of as Orion, there were three robbers. Um, and that was one of my favorite, the three stars of Orion's belt were three robbers. Well, a lot of people are telling us on social media that uh, Orion is their favorite constellation. Oh, yeah. And you mentioned the, uh, the use of the stars by the Polynesians to navigate around the Pacific. And even here now in our own time, we can use constellations to find other things in the night sky. So the example that I always think of is using the stars in the belt of Orion to find your way to 
Sirius in Canis Major, which is the brightest star in the night sky. Um, Orion just resonates with people for some reason. My guess is it's because it, for many cultures, represents a human figure. Do you have any any thoughts on that? Any ideas why people like it so much? Well, it's really nice because there was a bright, bright stars. I mean, it's a it's a really lovely size constellation where you get to see kind of the whole thing for a good long while in the winter time for us here in the northern hemisphere. Um, uh, so I think it's the brightness of the constellation that helps and also having the symmetry is really nice of the two bright ones at the top and the two bright ones on the bottom with the belt in between. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So as we're exploring the constellations this week and we, we've been talking about it in several of the presentations actually uh, and the stories that they represent around the world, do you have any tips that you can share with us um, about the, the things that really inspire us or touch us about the constellations? And in, in particular about being respectful to the cultures that have these stories about how we should, you know, um, you know, be respectful of that in telling the stories. And we want to, you know, of course, share our enthusiasm about the night sky, but we want to do it in a way that um, really pays tribute to these cultures. What do you think about that? I definitely recommend looking up um, people telling their own stories. There are quite a few stories online and some of the extensions and um, links that we have on the activity um, will direct you to those. The stories are certainly best heard by native tellers of those stories. So I would definitely, I mean, the stories are wonderful and varied and um, so representative of, of many different cultures and what's important to them. I would recommend um, listening. I mean, the lovely part is so much of this is found now online by native storytellers um, or storytellers from lots of different cultures. So I would recommend finding them because they tell it the best. And that actually relates to a question that we have from Stacy K, who's writing on YouTube. And she asks, what resources do you have for recommending about learning more about global constellation traditions? Are there any particular resources that you like? Yeah, there is this fabulous website called Figures in the Sky. Um, and I've got the link in the, I can add it here in just a second. But Figures in the Sky is a really interesting way of viewing uh, constellations in the night sky and uh, from cultures all around the world and, um, and over time. Um, that's one of my favorite. Uh, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, we also have a resource list. I think it's called um, Astronomy of Many Cultures Resource Guide, and it breaks it down by continent and um, lists some of the best resources for learning about constellations in different places around the world. Okay. Yeah. And we have a question from Jessica via YouTube, and this is um, this is of a special interest, I think, to us in the West as we try to balance um, in science and communication, especially the need to get across really sound scientific concepts while again paying tribute to these traditional stories and the value and power that they have. How do you transition between the science of sky to legend so people understand the difference? It's a really good question. Um, well, so I like to incorporate them together. I don't think that, uh, I think interpretations of the night sky change over time and there may be different interpretations once we learn more. Um, I think that science is one way of interpreting the night sky. It depends on the situation and it's not always necessarily the best way. I think when you're connecting with people, often the best way is storytelling. Um, the science of the night sky to me are amazing stories. I love the stories of um, supernova explosion or um, uh, planets around other stars, looking up and noticing that probably all of these stars have planets around them, their own solar systems. That's a, that's a thrilling story and that's a science story to me. So I think, um, I think that science is just one of the stories that we tell about the night sky. And I don't know that it's more or less important than the others. And I wouldn't say that it is personally. I just think, um, I, I think differentiating is fairly easy in that there are different types of stories, but I think that, um, but I think just honoring that they're all different ways of seeing the night sky is a uh, one way of doing it. 
I'd love to hear how you guys do it. <laughs> um, related to that, do you think that it's fair to say that in um, particularly here in the West, because we are, you know, our, our culture, we're, we're focused a lot on science, um, that that is how we make sense of the night sky in the same way that um, people, storytellers in the oral traditions in different parts of the world, we're we really all doing the same thing ultimately and we're just coming about it from different ways. I think that's a great way to look at it. Um, my son sees Orion and since he was very young, he doesn't see a human, he sees um, a rocket ship. And he's got his own way with Beetlejuice at the tip of the rocket ship and the three uh, belt stars being the bottom. He did, That's exactly what he sees. It's. I think we each get to interpret the night sky in the way that it calls to us. Well, that's really wonderful, Vivian. I'm, I'm so glad that you're here today to, to share this with us. We've got um, plenty more comments and questions and, on social media that we're, we don't quite have time to get to, but we certainly want to thank everybody who um, shared them with us. Let me give you one more question um, for the benefit of everybody. Vivian, what is the best way for people to reach you if they have any questions or comments or want to know more about the activities? Absolutely. If you go to that activity guide, um, there is a contact us um, at the bottom of that page and you can reach me there. There are a few of us who monitor that and we're happy to talk with you. If you have any questions, if you have um, suggestions on the activity, we're still making updates. Feel free to um, send us those as well. We love um, learning from you all. I learn all the time. Um, just like I call them stories sometimes instead of legends. Um, I Some of these we might be making mistakes on and we are happy to hear from people whose cultures we um, uh, talk with and uh, learn more about those and learn how to respectfully tell those stories. So I enjoy, uh, I enjoy learning that kind of information and happy to make changes as we go. Great. And, and again, that permanent link uh, is bit.ly slash legends in the sky. Um, so definitely be, uh, uh, you know, go check that out, um, find what they have to offer and look for updates in the future also is what it sounds like. Um, we posted that in the comments, that link as well. So um, Vivian, once again, thank you so much for being here today and for sharing what you know with us. Thank you so much for having me. Happy Dark Sky Week. <laughs> And thanks to all of you again for attending today's presentation. We have many more presentations and activities still to come during International Dark Sky Week. So again, visit idsw.darksky.org to find a list of presenters and a schedule for what's coming up next. The videos of the presentations during the week are posted to the IDA YouTube channel as soon as they become available. So be sure to check there uh, as well. So. From all of us here in Tucson, thanks again for joining us and joining us for the other activities we have still coming up during International Dark Sky Week.